the word of the Lord. And the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Sovereign Lord God. You have predestined all things and nothing surprises you at all. Lord, we thank you for bringing our attention to your word and to the text of Haggai today. Help us to learn what it is you want us to learn. Give us ears to hear and hearts to respond in how you want us to. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Alright, so for uh, those of us who follow uh, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, God has called us to be holy, to be set apart, to live for him in all that we say, think and do, in all that we be. And we've heard this before in the letter of 1 Peter, uh, where it says in chapter 1 verses 15 to 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. So we are called to be a holy people, for God is holy. We are called to be holy because we are a chosen people. We are the royal priesthood of believers. Uh, and we are God's special possession. And as God's people, we are meant to be reflecting the nation that we belong to, the kingdom of God. <coughs> the Apostle Peter says later in his second letter, to keep checking your hearts and to grow. And he says this in 2 Peter 1 verses 5 to 8, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, Godliness, mutual affection, love, all good things, all holy things. Does doing these things make us holy? Well, let's go back to Haggai and let's see what he says in today's text. 
And he opens up with this question to the priest in verse 12. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Now Haggai here isn't asking this question to the priest to get an answer. He already knows the answer. I mean, he's a prophet. Haggai is making a point here. Just because something is holy, something else cannot be made holy just by its touch. He continued with another question in verse 13. Then Haggai said, If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. So when something clean touches something unclean, the unclean thing does not become clean. It's the other way around, isn't it? The clean thing becomes unclean by the touch of the unclean thing. Let me, let me put it another way. I'm playing football. Yes, Hayden soccer. I've just scored a goal. Yes, Hayden, miracles do happen. I've done a wild celebration, I've dived on the ground, I've spread my arms out and I get mud on me everywhere. And my teammates come over to me and they give me high fives and you know I love my high fives. Does the high fives from their nice sanitised clean hands make my muddy unclean hands clean? No, of course not. It's the way around, isn't it? My teammates' hands become dirty from my muddy hands, and my hands still have mud on them. So can you see the point that Haggai is making here? When unclean things touch clean things, the clean things become defiled, they become dirty, they become unclean, they become unholy. And this is how it is with sinners. Because look at this next statement from Haggai, it is absolutely crushing. He said this in verse 14, Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people, and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Put yourself in the position of someone hearing this, back in Haggai's day. You are one of God's people and you hear that you are unclean, you are defiled and anything you touch becomes dirty with you. And it doesn't matter what you do. You can lay a few bricks on uh, the foundation of the temple, you can do many good deeds for God. You can say God's praises all you want but doing any of those things by themselves will not make you holy. In the sight of God, everything you do, everything you touch, is dirty because you yourselves are not clean. Whew, this is heavy stuff, isn't it? And it gets worse. Haggai continues. He says, Now then, consider from this day onward, before a stone was placed upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight, and with mildew, and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider is the seed yet in the barn. Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. The work of God's people have yielded nothing. God says here through Haggai, you are unclean. You try and do good, but your efforts are half-hearted. 
In return, I struck you with hardship, and you still did not turn to me. And none of your work has yielded fruit. You have not been able to get ahead. You put yourself before me. The passage is showing here that God's people cannot be holy in their own strength. This is the key point. God's people cannot come to God with what they bring alone. And even with that list mentioned earlier from Peter's letter, we too can have the same half-hearted attitude in our faith like those in Haggai's day. Back then they planted seeds, they harvested the ground, but they were not yielding the crop that they so desired. They were trying to reap what they needed in their own strength and in their own mind, but they yielded nothing. It is the same for us. We cannot achieve holiness in our own strength. We cannot achieve holiness by our own good works. The gospel of good works does not make us holy. We cannot achieve salvation ourselves. No matter how much we do, we cannot save ourselves. Anyone saying that is promoting a human-centered gospel. We were born with the condition of original sin inherited from our ancestors. The wages of sin is death. And unholy things cannot make themselves holy. So what was the hope that God gave his people back in Haggai's day? Where is the good news in this text? And how can it encourage us today? I love the way it ends in verse 19. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, I will bless you. We had a fantastic communion earlier where we heard about God blessing his people, and it's wonderful. God has reached out to his people, and he gave them hope. God blessed them. They did not deserve it. They gave half-hearted worship, but they were given hope. The only hope, the hope that lies in God. God gave his people grace. His holiness was such that it made the unclean clean. Only the divine could truly clean the unclean with his blessing. So how can sinners serve a holy God? Well, it is because God has granted it. It's as simple as that. God has blessed his people. We cannot achieve holiness by ourselves. It can only be received. And holiness has been granted to us despite us being sinners. This is the blessing from God. If you are here today and you are a Christian, you have been blessed by God. And that's wonderful. So Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift from God, not a result of works. There it is, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I know we mention that verse a lot, but it's crucial. God blesses out of his grace. We are saved by his blessing. And it's only then that we get to do good things for the Lord. And this is why we stress here at ECG that works does not save. Not, no work can save a single soul. Only God can save. Anyone saying to God on the day of judgment, well, I've lived a good enough life, so I deserve to be in heaven. Whoever is saying that is in denial of their true condition. None of us can get into heaven on our own strength. And this is why Jesus had to die for us. The Holy Son of God died for unholy sinners. 
And he proved his holiness was able to make anyone clean before God. That's why we had the uh, Bible reading from Mark's Gospel earlier. Uh, dead girls cannot make themselves alive, can they? The bleeding woman of 12 years, she could not stop her bleeding. Neither had the power to make themselves clean, to make themselves holy. The dead girl had her dad plead to Jesus on her behalf when she was dying. The bleeding woman had spent everything trying to stop the bleeding. They could not stop bleeding death themselves. One command from Jesus, and the dead girl woke up. Twelve years of age. One touch of his garment, twelve years of bleeding for the woman, stopped. Both made pure by Christ. And we know as Christians that because of the death of Jesus at the cross, Jesus transfers his clean righteousness unto us and our unholy sin unto him. Our debt, our uncleanness, had been paid in full. And that is the gospel. So when God sees us now, he sees the righteousness of Christ on us. We are clothed in Christ Jesus with his clean robes. Unfortunately, yes, we still sin. It is inherent in our fallen condition, even as saved Christians. For the flesh is indeed weak. But as people who are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, we must remember that God has said to us in his word, be holy, for I am holy. It is in our response to King Jesus, in our service to him, that God wants us to strive for holiness, to strive in doing good things, not for salvation, but so he can continually bless us and bless others too. We don't start our service as Christians to God when we are perfect in our own strength. Otherwise, church would not exist. But God says, be holy. Be what you are, a child of mine. And the blessings of God go out to the world when other people see the difference that Christianity makes when Christians are striving for holiness. When Christians are being loving towards each other and their neighbour. When Christians sell uh, show self-control and not get be quick to anger. When Christians are wanting to know more about God's word and being steadfast in his goodness. But some of us may be wondering, well, what good thing can I do for God? Some of us may even be thinking, our lives are in a mess, they're in a royal mess. Maybe through no fault of our own or maybe through sins we committed. And we ask, how can I be of any use to God? It's that question again, isn't it? How can sinners serve a holy God? It is because God first blessed his people. He has blessed his people by saving them. He has blessed us with his word so that we can check our hearts daily to see what areas we are half-hearted in, so that we can strive to live more for him. And when we strive for holiness, others will see it too. Remember it said earlier in Peter's text, that if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we are giving God praise and glory, especially in the most trying times of our lives, others will see what the kingdom of God is like. We don't do good things to get God. We get to do good things for God because he has blessed us. 
And so our response to him ought to be one of gratitude, one of joy, instead of half-heartedness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ Jesus, the new creation has gone, the old has gone. If you are here and you are saying that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, then you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are a child of God. Please be assured of that. And no matter what our circumstances are, our response to God ought to be of joy. Because God has saved us from hell eternally. He has blessed us mightily. He has made us his children. And that is the true blessing. Even when we have been half-hearted, he still has not let us go. And I pray that when we leave this building today, our lips are praising God because he never lets us go. God is a truly wonderful, loving God. And as we grow as Christians, he allows us to serve him because of his holy son Jesus and his righteousness clothed on earth. We are indeed very blessed. Amen? Amen. 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 We will hear more next week on how sinners can serve a holy God. But for now, let's go to our wonderful God in prayer. Let's give God the praise and glory that his name deserves. And we're going to pray silently for a few moments about what God has spoken about today. And then I will finish and hand back over to Barry. So uh, let's have a few moments of silent prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your holiness. Thank you that despite ourselves, you have blessed us, Lord. This is nothing that we have done, but what you have done for us, Lord. You reached out to us, Lord. You gave us the gospel of the Holy Son, Jesus Christ that anyone trusting in his name and repenting of their sins, Lord, will know you, will have eternal life with you. And that is wonderful, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful blessing, Lord. May our lips be forever praising your name and giving you glory until the day approaches. Lord, we know that our works do not save us, it's only you who saves us. But Lord, thank you that we get to do good things for you. Thank you for this blessing, Lord. Thank you that we can serve you despite ourselves. Lord, thank you for giving us communion and for the regular reminder of what you have done for us. Thank you that we are constantly reminded because we do fall short. We need you, Lord. We need the cross. We need to take up our cross daily. And we just thank you, Lord, that you never let us go. It's not based on our performance. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we thank you for that blessing, Lord. Lord, as we finish up the service today, Lord, help us to praise your name above all names. Help us to live holy lives for you. Help us to proclaim to those who do not yet know you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.